1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, this is 15 verses. In these 15 verses, a form of the word love is used 26 times. So 26 times in 15 verses tells us what is the theme of these 15 verses? Love. I mean, it's just over and over and over again uh, the term is used. So uh, he starts off in verse 7 by talking about what is the foundation of love. So we understand what we're talking about when we're talking about love. Because if you ask people for a definition of love, my goodness, are you going to get a variety of responses. So <clears throat> the, the first thing about the foundation of love is that it is a part of God's nature. Look at how he says it, Beloved, let us one, love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So when it says that love is from God, what it's saying is that love is, uh, God is the source of love. We know how to love, we know what love is, because of God. And so love comes from Him. It is a part of His nature. And, and two or three times in this passage, he makes the statement that he drops first of all in verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. This is God's nature. Now, I want to just say a, a quick word here. When the Bible says that God is love, this is not a statement that overrides other statements in the Bible. The Bible also says that God is just. The Bible says that God is a man of war. The Bible says that God will not acquit the guilty. So there are, there are a lot of people who this is their favorite verse because they use this as the sole characteristic of God to exclusion of all others. And then the definition becomes love is when I approve of anything that you do. Neither one of those are true. First of all, love is not approval of what you want to do. And love is not the only characteristic of God. God is multifaceted, just like you and I are multifaceted. So it says that God is love. What it's saying is that love is not something God does. Love is who God is. Therefore, when He does loving things, they flow from His nature. Now, for, I don't know if this stun you, for most of the world, this is a shocking statement. Throughout history, and around our globe, the vast majority of religions have had a God or a group of gods that are not loving. We have been raised in a society that has been predominantly influenced by Christianity. Therefore, most people in America have a concept of God is love, but most of the world does not. The thought that God would love us is shocking in many places in the world. And certainly throughout history, there's a shocking statement. This is the, the nature of God. If God did not love, if God was not love, then nothing else good for us could happen. Y'all seem to just kind of not care about the fact that God is love. It is, this is a part of His nature, who He is. This is a, a character, a perfection of God. 
But not only is this a part of God's nature, it is also a part of us if we belong to God. Look at how he words it in uh, verse 7. He says, Love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. That, that, that we have experienced the new birth. In other words, here's the way that it works. Most kids are a reflection of their parents. For good or for ill. In my own experience, children seem to be a better reflection of my negative qualities than of my positive ones. But they are a reflection. So what he's saying is, if you have been born again, if you belong to God through Son Jesus Christ as a child of God, you are a reflection of God. Therefore, because God is love, you and I love. Because we have a part of His character in us now because we belong to Him. So, Christians are loving for the, the foundations. That it's part of God's nature and then it has been given to us because we have the new birth. But notice what he says in verse 8. If you do not love, you do not know God. Now, this is one of the issues that a lot of people struggle with when they get to First John because he's just so blunt. And everything is just right or left or up or down or in or out. There's no kind of middle ground or anything. But I want to make sure clearly, but, but not like freaked, but some of you probably ought to be freaked out. You do not go to heaven because you said some prayer in church. Anybody can mouth words. We go to heaven because we belong to Jesus Christ, because we've been born again by Him. And when someone says, well, I know that person's crotchety and mean and ugly and all of those things, but you know when they were eight years old, they went to the front and said a prayer. I'm telling you, an angry, ugly heart that spews out anger and ugliness and harm and hatred towards people all the time is a sign that they probably do not know God. Regardless of some prayer they prayed as a kid. Now it gets really quiet here because people think, am I talking, is he talking about me? Yes. But since y'all are so loving, we know that you're not one of them. Right? And so he says, what he's saying is that, 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 that love is a, it's a measure of whether or not we belong to God. Whether or not we have been born again, whether or not we belong to Him. If you do not love, then you do not know. I mean, this kind of says it pretty straightforward. And this isn't because the Bible wants to be mean. It's because God wants us to be aware. The greatest deception that anyone can experience is to think that they belong to God and they do not. The greatest deception the devil wants to portray on people is that they are in when they are out. That they are found when they're lost. And so, John gives the warning is that love is a, is a sign in someone's life that they, they belong to God. And so, it's a part of God's nature. And so, now there's a, should be a part of ours because we have experienced the new birth. And then, the third thing about the foundation of love is that we get a picture of it. It's not some gooey sort of makeup, whatever you want to. This is what love looks like. Verse 9 In this, the love of God was made manifest. Now, once again, manifest one of these Bible words that we just don't use in normal, everyday life. The word means to be seen, to be visible, to show. So, in this, we see the love of God. This is how God's love was demonstrated. This is how we know what love looks like. That God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, I'm just going to use some, some, some terms here. When did we see God come into our world? When He was born in the barn. God sent His Son. Notice He says God sent His only Son. Now, it's, it's really significant that throughout the New Testament, the Bible does not talk about the birth of Jesus very much. Matthew gives us a brief account. Luke gives us a pretty lengthy description. You'd expect that. He's a doctor, and so, you know, it's kind of stuff fascinates him. But beyond that, there are hardly any statements about the birth of Jesus. Here is why. 
because Jesus was born as a human being, but he was sent as God. So the main description in the New Testament is not that Jesus was born into our world, but that Jesus was sent into our world. He did not begin in Bethlehem. Jesus always has been. And so that's why the Bible says that God sent His Son. And so every time the Bible talks about God sent His Son, it's actually making reference to the birth of Jesus. When He who was in heaven came from heaven and entered into our world. And so God sent His Son, but not just sent His Son, sent His only Son. Now what does it mean when the Bible describes Jesus as the only Son of God? It's very important terminology, and it really actually clears up a whole lot of stuff. When the Bible describes Jesus as the only begotten Son of God, it has nothing to do with birth. Because Jesus has always existed. So why is He always called the only Son? Because in the Bible, the term only Son means the Son with whom the Father has a unique relationship. <clears throat> so, let me give a Bible verse for it, and then I'll try to get some explanation so we understand it. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, it says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, reference to Genesis 22, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Now, if you've read the Bible, you know that Isaac was not the only son of Abraham. He had an older son named Ishmael. And then after his wife Sarah died, Abraham remarried at about 110, bought a big house near an elementary school, and started having more sons and daughters. So he had several sons, two that we know specifically by name, Ishmael and Isaac. So why does the Bible describe Isaac as Abraham's only son? It does it in Genesis 22, and then and it references it in Hebrews 11. Because Isaac is the son with whom Abraham had the unique relationship that the promises of God would be passed to Isaac, not to Ishmael. Both were sons, but there was a unique relationship between Abraham and Isaac. So here's the way that this works out with you and me and Jesus. I stand before you today, and I can tell you I am God's son. The Bible says to as many as received him, he gave authority to become the children of God. For John several times calls us the children of God. So I am God's son. But I guarantee you, my position as son is not the same as Jesus' position as son. He has a unique, so when it, it describes Jesus as God's son, what's saying is that he has a unique relationship with the Father, that relationship being that both of them are God. God the Father and God the Son. And then there's a third person of that trinity, God the Holy Spirit. So he says that he gave up the one with him, he has this unique relationship. He sent him into the world so that we might become children as well, so that we might live through him. And so here is the, the, the great event that made it happen. The way it says in verse uh, 10, In this is love, not that we love God. We aren't the ones who generated this act. God's the one who did it. He loved us, and it sent the Son, sent the son to be the, oh my goodness, the propitiation for our sins. Now, there's a word I know you use all the time. Honey, I was just reflecting today on propitiation. What in the world is the word propitiation? The, the, the word means to offer in place of. It's an interesting term because the, the word translated propitiation is actually the word for mercy seat. So in the Old Testament, Leviticus 16, there was a description where the, the, the tabernacle, and the tabernacle has a, an outer court, and it's got a, a building, and in the first room you came into, you find uh, a table of bread and a, a menorah, the candlestick, and an altar of incense, and the priests go in there. But then there was a heavy tapestry, and <clears throat> behind this tapestry is a very special room called the Holy of Holies, and in that room there resided only one item, the Ark of the Covenant. On the top of the Ark of the Covenant, the lid is called the mercy seat. So here's what would happen. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would kill a goat, and he would take the blood from the goat, and he would put it into a bowl, and he would have to crawl under, because the tapestry was very heavy, he'd have to crawl underneath the tapestry. And when he got in there, he would take the blood of that goat, and he would sprinkle that blood on the east side of the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, and then sprinkle it on top of the mercy seat. And God would descend in the pillar of cloud. And if God accepted the blood of that goat, the sins of the people were paid for that year. Here's the problem. 
Goat's blood is not enough to take care of all of your guilt. Matter of fact, the Bible makes it clear it's not good enough because guess what they did the next year? Same thing. Had to be done over and over and over again. Jesus, on the other hand, did not go into the Holy of Holies on the earth. He went into the Holy of Holies in heaven. And there he did not sprinkle goat's blood. He sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat. And the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ is good enough to cleanse us from all of our guilt. Jesus is the mercy seat where you and I have our guilt removed and are made right with God. This is the love of God in action. So someone says, how do I know that God loves me? Because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and to offer his own blood as a propitiation for our sins. And then the last thing about the foundation of love is that it's perfect. Man, when you and I love, we fall short. Some of you fall shorter than others, but we all fall short. But look what he says in verse 11. Beloved, if God loved us like that, sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. We're his children, we belong to him, and his love is perfected in us. What does it mean to be perfected? It is brought to completion. Here's the really cool thing that he's saying. You and I are separated from God. God loved us anyway. We've been disobedient to God. God loved us anyway. We stand guilty before God. God loves us anyway. But God doesn't just say, I love you. God demonstrates his love by sending his son Jesus to die for us and then to rise again on the third day. If this is what Jesus has done. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. How can I experience that forgiveness? By putting my faith in what Jesus Christ has done. That's when we're born again. We have a conversion experience and all that. Now, that all sounds really great and wonderful. But what happens after that? In other words, that's an initial experience of God's love in my life. The really good news is God doesn't say, okay, I'm done with you now. Time to move on to someone else. God not only loves us when he saves us, when he forgives us, when he grants us new life, but he continues to to develop and grow His love in us until someday it is brought to final completion. Now, when is that? When we get to heaven. So when I say I know absolutely without any doubt I'm going to heaven, what I'm saying is I know that the love that God has begun in my life is going to be completed in heaven, and God never leaves anything undone. His love is perfected in us. He is going to bring it to completion. Now, I want to see if I can help us to grasp what he's getting at. There are various ways of expressing love. One of them, or some of them, are very nice, but they're not difficult. You're holding hands. You put your arm around your wife. You sit side by side. She puts her hand on your knee, or whatever it is, you rub her hair, or whatever. You know, I don't know what all those, all those kind of things, all those things are expressions of love. And I think we should do those in the proper context. Let me make sure to say that. <laughs> uh, but there, there's a, it, and those are all fine. Those are, but then there are some acts of love that cost. Now, sometimes the cost is not a whole lot. Sometimes it's more. You can swing by the grocery store and they got the flowers that are beginning to wilt. They're only a couple of bucks. And that's a sign of love, Right? Or you can go ahead and pony up a $10 bill and get a fresh dozen, and they'll last for three days instead of one. But you buy flowers, you can get cards. She sits down and watches a movie where the dude kills all the bad guys and everything blows up. Why does she do that? Because it, it costs some time, and she stays awake, and actually is not on her phone, but that's okay. And, and at Christmas time, once... Once, you'll show your love by enduring some cheesy Hallmark movie that fits one of the six storylines that they repeat over and over and over again. And you stay awake, and you only make fun of the movie three or four times. Why? Because this is what we do. Now it's a little costing some time. So sometimes it costs money, sometimes it costs Sometimes it's a more expensive cost because it's an anniversary. 
I thought every woman would yes, this could be very expensive. It involves a jewelry store. Okay, but some use the jewelry counter at Walmart. But regardless, it's more than just a dozen roses. And guys, let me just interject right here. It does not involve a vacuum cleaner. Appliances are not a love gift unless they are specifically requested. So you haven't been married long, you need to note this and note it well. So there's the, the, the free stuff, the holding hands off. Then there are the things cost. But sometimes, love is a really sane and an incredible act of sacrifice. We know this, interestingly enough, probably more by what parents do than what spouses do. The sacrifices that parents make for their children. And it is a lousy parent who complains about sacrificing for a child that they love. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that God begrudgingly sent His Son. That God complains about, well, look what it cost me. If you only understood what it cost me, you're a bunch of ungrateful twerps. God doesn't do that. God sacrificed for us. It is the ultimate sacrifice. When he gave up the life of his son. The Bible says, No greater love has a man than this, and he lays down his life. So when the Bible talks about love and God's love for us, it's not just a hand holding love. And it's not just a dozen flowers kind of love. It is a give up my life kind of love. That's the way God has loved us. And when you understand that's the kind of love the Bible describes. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad I have a God who's moved beyond just a hand-holding love for us. Hello? A God who has sacrificed for us. So, if that's what love is like, the nature of God expressed to the giving of a son is going to be completed in us, then what effect should that have on us? Well, he's going to begin discussing that in verse 13. The first one is that we want to confess the one who has loved us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit, and we have seen and testified. We proclaim, we are unashamed to declare that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. We testify that Jesus is our Savior. His love compels us to tell other people that He has loved us like this, and that they too can experience this kind of love. So notice how he describes in verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he is in God. But, you know, here it is again. We're not just saying we love God with some kind of ooey-gooey emotion, but that we have committed ourselves to him because he committed himself to us. God's love for us, in other words, compels us to love. Because we are to be a reflection of our Heavenly Father. So he says, this is what we are to do. We are to confess Christ. But we're not just confessing. We are to do it with boldness. He gets on this again. Uh, verse 16. We have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and who abides in love, abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this is love perfected with us. So we may have confidence for the day of judgment. We recognize that because of God's love... Now, watch how this works. What he drops us in there. We recognize that God has loved us through the Son, Jesus. We have a boldness about our relationship with God because we believe that His love will be completed in us. So, look at how he ties that together then at the end of verse 17. That we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in this world. Now, here's what he's saying. The word confidence, interestingly enough, means to be free. Not worried. If you have experienced the love of Jesus Christ and you belong to Him, it is guaranteed that He will complete that love in you. He will take you to heaven. So you need not worry about the day of judgment. You will be fine if you belong to Jesus Christ. So when people say, you know, I are you going to heaven? Well, I'd like to think so. 
Yes, me, I'm going to, yes, I'm going to heaven. Yes, I will pass the day of judgment. Not because of me, but because I belong to Jesus Christ and he will see me through the day of judgment. I am not worried about standing before the judgment throne of God because Jesus is going to stand with me because I belong to him. And he's going to finish what he began in me. It's just that we can have a, a boldness and a, and, and, and a confidence in the day of judgment because we are his. So, what does that mean? That means that we serve God not because we're afraid of what he's going to do to us, but as a response to his love for us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear, <clears throat> fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. In other words, whoever serves God because they're afraid, he's, he's the boogeyman who's going to get them. They don't understand the love of God. They don't grasp the beauty of what Jesus Christ has done. And the worst part is, they don't get to enjoy the freedom that we have in Jesus. We are not people who are afraid of what God is going to do to us. We are people who celebrate what God has done for us. And so we have a confidence in it, and a boldness in it, and a joy. And so we have <clears throat> we confess Christ. We have a life of boldness because we know that we're headed to heaven and nothing can stop it. And then the last phase that we love one another. Verse 19. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Because if you love God, you're going to love like God. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Our love for other people flows from us because we've experienced the love of God. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And in other words, here's what he is saying. When people see us, the thing they should see is our love for each other and our love for them. And I'm just going to say that, unfortunately, we have too many Christians who are showing something else. Arrogance, self-righteousness, self-holiness, better than everybody else kind of mentality. No, what we can show is a love that wants to sacrifice for others. But you know what? There is no way to stop God's love when it flows through God's people. Now, even though they should see it, the reality is not everybody's going to see it. Most people will see it. It should be obvious. It should, don't you think it should be obvious? I'm just going to help us understand what means it should be obvious. Well, my wife started college before I did because I didn't want to go to school, but anyway. <clears throat> so I'd gone to school and, and took extra hours and all caught up with it so we could graduate together. So one of the things that was required, you had to have four physical education classes. And so PE classes, and it's college, you had to have four of them. And so they were offering a summer early morning tennis class. Like, well, look, we can take that one and get that out of the way, and we're done, and we can take it together. Um, I was passing a church uh, 20 miles from the school that we were at, so we got up early every morning, got there for this, I don't know, 6 or 7 a.m., whatever time it was. Now, it's not early for me, but man, for Jerry. <clears throat> now, now that is, this, let me create the picture for you. We arrive in the same car. We get out, and we stand together to begin your class. Oftentimes, we're holding hands. Every time we're supposed to divide up and work on something together, Jerry and I are always working on it together. When class is over, we get into the same car and drive away. We are both wearing wedding bands. Can we all say that it should be obvious we're married to each other? I mean, it should be obvious. So we were in, I don't know, that second week of class. Yes, poor guy. Now, you can understand, her version of the story is different than mine, but mine is always better. Uh, and so, <clears throat> we're standing there side by side, and this guy walks up to her and says, hey, would you like to get together and play tennis sometime? He's asking on a date. I mean, that's what he's doing. Now, just say he wasn't. I'm like, oh, please. And she says, well, I, I ride with him. I can't say this is my husband. She says, I ride with him. 
Well, that just doesn't hold you a whole lot to be confident. She goes, I'm with him. And he says, oh. And then she says, we're married. He goes, oh. Now, out of the class, like 25 people, there was one person that just dismissed it. But I'm, I'm guessing if you ask the other two dozen class, they would know we were married. It was obvious. It should have been obvious. So when I say that it should be obvious that people see God's love in us, I'm aware that some people are still not going to see it. Now, some of them are going to miss it. But the majority of people that we live life around, that we encounter, should see God's love in us. It should be obvious. They should, even if they don't say clearly you're a Christian, they should say, there's something different about you. That's what they should say. They should see the difference that Jesus has made in our life. And that's what John is getting at. Here is how we can see God's love because he sent his son Jesus to be the propitiation of our sins, to be our Savior. And people should see Jesus in us because we have experienced his love. We now want to show his love to the world. But to do that, we must recognize that God is love. We must be convinced of his love. Listen, if you are hurting, God is love. If you are alone, God is love. If you are troubled, you need to be reminded that God is love. When you act foolishly, God is still love. If you are doubting, God is still love. If you are worried, God is love. If you are suffering, God is love. If you have been rejected, God is love. If you are behaving sinfully, God is still love. If you are under attack, God is love. If you feel like you're without hope, God is love. If you are afraid, I want you to know that God is love. How do we know that God is love? Because He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins. We have seen the love of God in His Son, Jesus Christ, and the world to see the love of God in our lives. We have seen it, and we should show it. We have experienced it, and we should share it. John says, man, it's great that God is love. But that's not just what we get. The love of God is what we give. 